This is Mike. Um, joined today in a really interesting conversation by Colleen Keating Crawford and Elizabeth Booz from Teach for America's Reinvention Lab. They recently released a study on perceptions of life after high school, both from the folks who are providing help to youth, but also from youth who are still in high school or are just beginning their journey after high school. Focusing on their perceptions, the headline really is that they're concerned. They're not sure whether college is going to be able to deliver, but at the same time, there's some deep belief in the power of college to convey some sense of social legitimacy. They outline the three things youth are looking for after college. One is economic mobility. Two is a sense of personal identity and belonging. And three is that sense of social legitimacy. And then they also get into a really interesting framework for groups who are trying to help youth successfully navigate that transition, crossing the canyon, which is the name of the study, and outline four different types of help, whether it's trail guides, transport helicopters, bridge builders, or map makers. We get into all this in depth in the conversation. We'll also include links to the Crossing the Canyon report in the show notes for the episode so you can keep up with us as we're talking and or dig into it further for yourself. Really interesting conversation. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. I'm joined today by some folks from Teach for America's Reinvention Lab. Today, I'm joined by Elizabeth Booz and Colleen Keating Crawford. Welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be here. Great to be here, Michael. Yeah. It's great to have both of you here. We're going to be talking about the Reinvention Lab. And then specifically, there's some recent research, a report called Crossing the Canyon, Ethnographic Findings About Life After High School. That's going to be the main focus of the conversation. But we're going to start a little bit higher up and hopefully get to know each of you a little bit better. Starting with you, Elizabeth, can you catch us up on your origin story and how that's connecting to the topic we're going to be talking about today? Yeah, yeah. So I work at the Reinvention Lab as our Senior Managing Director of Story and Brand. So I do all of our storytelling work. But I got here first, I was a teacher. So when I graduated college, I joined Teach for America and was a teacher in Kansas City. The fifth graders I taught just last spring graduated high school, which makes me feel old. So yeah, I taught and then joined staff as a coach for first and second year core members six years ago, and then mm. positioned to work here at the Reinvention Lab about four years ago. So yeah. yeah, I've been involved with Teach for America in some way since 2011. Right. And then the Reinvention Lab is what exactly? So the Reinvention Lab is Teach for America's R&D research and development lab. We work as like a research hub and product studio for work that lives at the intersection of like equity and innovation to just mm. help organization like think about and integrate innovative practices into our offerings now and in the future. Yeah. And then that really brings us to this Crossing the Canyon research. And Colleen, that's been something you've been playing point on. Can you catch us up on your origin story and then how that connects to the Crossing the Canyon work? Yeah. So coming at you from Cincinnati, Ohio. So origin of, of geographic placement. I'm in the middle of the country and I'm originally from the Midwest. My background is actually being from Michigan. My formal training is in architecture and design. I am a daughter of an architect and an educator, my father and my mother. And in hearing about Teach for America on college campus, shifted to do that, thinking about, well, if really what I want to do is equity and housing, I really want to make sure that I know about the other systems and the inequitable systems in our society that housing impacts and is impacted by. Yeah. So joined Teach for America as a, a 2007 Bay Area Corps member, taught out there for a number of years, got my master's in education, 
And from there, the plan was to then go back into architecture and specifically focus on housing equity. Mm. And as with many of us who joined Teach for America, it by design kind of derails the goals that we had for ourselves as folks in college. And I just became obsessed with this issue of educational inequity. I came on a staff, I think, 14 years ago, worked specifically in recruitment and then moved into overseeing our executive recruitment. And what I loved about that that actually connects to this work is I've always loved people's stories and journeys about my own, listening to and understanding others, the choice points that they made, why they made the choice points they made, the meaning making, the learning that they're having from it, being able to vibe as humans on that because we're all living journeys and constantly making different choice points and yeah. sometimes backtracking and just the beauty of like things not being linear mm-hmm. and always having the opportunity to say, I think actually I'm going to turn left in three quarters. And so that brought me as an executive hiring partner to Michelle Culver, the founder of the Reinvention Lab. I then came on to staff, helped her build the Reinvention Lab. And the seat that I sit in today is a senior designer. So similar to Elizabeth, I'm a senior managing director, but specifically focused on the research and the design, doing research like this that helps us be able to design really well. Yeah. And the problem space is hugely relevant. You know, right now it's graduation time. I I did just share on a recent episode, my five-year-old just stepped up from kindergarten. It was very exciting and delightful to see that experience and to share it with him. There is a lot of passages. There are passages that we go through throughout our lives. And I think around June, the end of the traditional academic calendar, people frequently are thinking about those types of passages. I know it's been central to Teach for America and its mission over the years, but it's interesting, the reinvention lab focusing on the transition post high school into like a successful, thriving adulthood. Can you talk about the problem space a little bit? Yeah. So a year and a half ago, as project that I was leading called the design practice that was specifically for helping internal teams within TFA dig into sticky spaces or spaces that they wanted to make a breakthrough and specifically Mm. a reinvented learning breakthrough. But they're just like, this is sticky. I don't quite know how to navigate this. I and, and a team of us were coaching them on how to make breakthroughs in like big reinvented learning ways. There was a host of teams that we were guiding through this over half a dozen. And a year and a half ago, as we were culminating it, and I'm looking at the trends and the themes, we're constantly looking at trends and themes, right, within the reinvention lab and within learning to understand Mm -hmm. and and education to understand what's happening and what does it mean about how we should be pivoting, shifting. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at that and with the team, we realized that, geez, like a lot of the trajectory of where these different teams are headed or the problem spaces that they're thinking about or that comes after the thing that they're thinking about or that touches, these are all kind of like in different ways and nuanced ways touching and circling around life after high school, Mm. which is a new space for Teach for America. We've always been K through 12. Right. And pre-primary, but like that public school space has been the space that we've always operated in. Mm -hmm. And yet it's evident that learning has multiple outcomes, right? Like it's the joy of learning. It's the growing in and evolving and developing. But also, like, there's the learning towards things that are very, like, concretely important, like money and earnings and building wealth and supporting my family and having increased self-actualization around, like, what does this step then help me to be able to do next? And so knowing that K through 12 isn't just K through 12. K through 12 is a purpose for something beyond 12. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And being in that exploration space of, okay, what is beyond 12? What are our youth thinking about beyond 12, right. beyond after high school? What are the things that they're trying, that they're testing? What are they thinking about it? What's the meaning making that they're having? What are the frustrations and the obstacles, the joys and the breakthroughs? We just wanted to understand more of that because it's no secret to our society right now. Like, I mean, this is a whole arena of conversation of like, what all should we be talking and thinking about? And we really wanted to understand from those who are preparing for life after high school or already navigating it as young people and then the adults who are supporting them, be that like parents, guardians, older siblings who are like just, you know, a couple years or or a decade ahead. And then, of course, the organizations and the people who exist to support youth. Right. Yeah. And that's what I started reflecting on a little more when I was thinking about Teach for America, because it was surprising, but then it started to make more sense in a couple of ways. One is, you know, you're both examples of folks who have found 
meaning and successful pathways through Teach for America itself. So like it is an actual bridge across this canyon to one extent. And then the other is really more the the actual students you're talking to. You don't want that conversation to end when they leave your classroom. You want to make sure they're really successful throughout their lives. You know, I talked to a lot of different folks from different parts of the education ecosystem. There has been a bit of a, an awakening about adopting a bit of a broader perspective to not be overly narrow and siloed, where as an educator, you know, Elizabeth, your students graduate fifth grade. It's not like they're no longer your problems. You know, like they're actually still part of your lives if things work well. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to like extend that point to to say that like this research, the reinvention lab are all emerging very much at a particular like moment. This is a moment in education where I think there is that broadening. And it's also a moment in the evolution of this organization where like Colleen and I came up in TFA when there was a heavy focus on like, let's take high-performing college students and professionals and bring them into this industry and start shifting individual trajectories to continue having a leadership impact in the field of education. Yeah. That was the focus for so many years that Teach for America grew to have this network of core members and alumni that was at first 500 people and now is like 68,000 if you right. think about core members and alumni. So there's mm. been a shift that led to this moment Teach for America where their focus has become, our focus has become like the collective potential impact of that 68,000 mm. network. Mm. And therefore, like the innovation and leadership that can come out of that across industries and sectors. So yeah. from this like silo, let's get individuals into the classroom and shift their trajectories to like, okay, we've been doing that for decades. We have this network. How do we think about impact as a collective and not mm. as individuals? And how yeah. do we also start integrating like innovation into our practices. So we've seen with Teach for America starting Ignite, a tutoring program they run, like the shift from just placing core members in a classroom to like, how do we actually bring college students into relationship with young people now before they've graduated college? And mm -hmm. like that starts to like broaden our potential impact. So yeah, I think this research is coming at a moment where both nationally and organizationally there's this recognition that there's not going to be a silver bullet and mm -hmm. putting teachers in the classroom for two years many of whom stay long beyond that but like that is not a silver bullet that's going to solve the most pressing issues we're seeing also just thinking about pre-k through 12 is not going to always get us the answers and impact we need so like the willingness to let us take on this research and look at how are people faring when they leave the schools that we mostly partner with, yeah, yeah, I think it's really part and parcel with where we are right now in this like, again, moment. Yeah, yeah. and and part of that moment is also more critical takes on higher ed in terms of its affordability, the huge problem of some college no degree, and just a general you know mistrust of some of the institutions that really have been powering our systems, including educational systems, you know, some of the equity critiques you were putting out there, Colleen, you know, higher ed's in, in a bit of a tricky spot nowadays. And even taking a step back from that, the students who are going through that passage are dealing with some real challenges. And that's why I thought the fact that your methodology had an ethnographic approach was something that I did really like. It does tie also to this theme of storytelling and, and kind of getting to know what's unique about people. Can you describe the approach and, and really what led you to coming at this from really more of an ethnographic lens? Yeah, it's rooted in, I mean, that piece that I spoke to earlier around just the love of understanding people's stories. Mm -hmm. We've, and I, when I say we, I should say like myself and my fellow researchers, Michelle Gia and Gautam Marimuthu, both lecturers at the D School, as we were like seeing this trend, having a conversation with Michelle Gia around like, there's more need finding to do to really understand what's happening here. And Michelle Gia is an expert at need finding. Like this is literally what she lectures on and what she teaches at the D mm -hmm. school. The Stanford D school. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that clarification. The desire to have ethnographic research was to be able to get the nuance of the storytelling. Like there's such a depth and a richness that you can understand mm -hmm. so much with this. We would not 
we would never have been able to, or it would have taken a lot more work to be doing surveys in quant and nothing against quant. Like there's actually beautiful quant that you will see like folded into from others who are experts in that. We have the expertise and experience in the qualitative and in specifically listening to and understanding people's stories and experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's where the richness and the nuance that really shaped this specifically came. Not just the insights, but even like the metaphors. There's this metaphor woven through. And so as we were having conversations, we had ethnographic conversations with over 50 individuals who are experiencing life after high school, either as a young person who is preparing for life after high school as a high schooler, or individuals, young people who have recently departed from high school and are actually navigating it or very freshly reflecting back on what they just navigated. Mm -hmm. And then the adults who support them, specifically leaders and, and founders and folks who are setting vision and direction and strategy for the organizations who are supporting them very intentionally in different ways. Right. And in those conversations, one of the first insights that came up that actually became this beautiful metaphor that's woven throughout the research is we heard youth describing life after high school as confusing, risky, and undersupported. And that mm. risky piece is huge. They were literally describing things like, I was told that if I like did all these things, if I checked all these boxes, if I like played the game the right way, mm. I got the grades, I did the extracurriculars, I had the experiences. If I like finished my like sheet, like my sheet of to-dos, if I did my high school sheet of to-dos, then all will be well. And if I like yeah. get into a college and it's specifically a really great college, then I'll just like enter into that and the access to that space is going to be everything that I need. And I'll continue to like walk in this beautiful, you know, bucolic, like easy journey. And they started to say, and yet it's not like that. Right. Like I got to 12th grade. I got to like the moment after my graduation and I realized the landscape totally falls away. I feel like there's this crumbling rock and it's all just crumbling. And literally, even as I like retell it, I get goosebumps because I hear their voices and their anxiety in their voice. Yeah. And yeah. that's the part of the stuff that like comes out in the ethnographic research when we're actually on calls and conversations like this. And they're saying the landscape just gives way and I'm literally tripping and stumbling. And I feel like it's all my fault. Like yeah. I, I didn't do something I didn't know. Mm. And yet... What I understood from everybody who was supporting me along the way was it's going to be great. And right. so tripping and stumbling, I'm thinking, what did I do wrong? How did I mess up? It's not supposed to be this way. And they yeah. all have so many of them were having this narrative and they were saying, and it's just me. And like this is also part of the isolation of their generation is the narratives like they're not sharing it out loud and they all think that they are the only one experiencing this. Yeah. And the ethnographic stuff makes sense when you mentioned the D school, because there is this element of like user research and sort of the product revolution that has hit in the 21st century. In a lot of ways, education is not really catching up or is, is falling behind, you know, the jobs to be done kind of framework. Like, how do you actually get to know what the customer's needs are? Well, it's by actually talking to the customers. And like, I, I feel like lots of post-secondary pathway stuff happens really without that voice. What are you learning about the problems students are, are facing? I guess there's some fear prior to it. And then once they're in it, it doesn't get better a lot of the time. So can you kind of tease out a little bit what your yeah. findings are? Yeah. So as they're describing this, what kind of became this metaphor of this canyon that they're describing in the crumbling landscape and tripping and stumbling and not knowing how to navigate it and feeling alone. And actually, it's interesting. Let me back up because part of the problem space or just like or problem opportunity, these are always just like the different side of the same coin. Yeah. I'm still workshopping problematunity. I don't think it's quite there yet, but it, but <laughs> yeah, I am workshopping it. Yeah. I'll Opera, use it. I'll use it. Opera Blem, I think, is worse, but I don't know. I'm still, <laughs> it's still workshopping, you know? So what's really interesting is that every single person we spoke with, young person or adult, every single person. And we actually asked everybody, like, tell me your own journey. Because us as adults, like, we are people who traverse this journey, you know, however long ago, but we also traversed it. We're just the grown version who maybe hopefully have more reflections on it. Maybe not. We were still processing through it. We still have some baggage probably through it. Some yes. of us have a lot of debt from it mm. um, and all of those things. And so what's interesting is that every single person that we interviewed, they all reflected on when we asked them to, like, tell us your journey, tell us 
what it was like and and what you did and why you did it, every single person spoke about college. And they spoke specifically about a four-year college and that there was this societal expectation to go to and through a four-year college and best if you can like get one of like the best versions of that, like the most elite versions of that, the most exclusive. Yeah. And that if they didn't, if they chose something else, even if like they're like, I know this is the right decision for me. Like, I know I really want to go into construction and the right. best, most thoughtful path for me to get there for multiple metrics is to go to a trade school or I really want to go to a community college. Whatever decision they made, if it wasn't a four-year college, they felt a ton of social stigma because yeah. the way that it that that the that first step after high school is spoken about society, like what they had deeply internalized was that a four-year college is the premier and anything else is less than mm -hmm. it's sub. Mm -hmm. And so they internalized that narrative of if I don't choose a four-year college, if I don't make it to and through a four-year college, and if I choose community college or something else, then I am less than. Right. They're already entering into this journey with this internal narrative that they perceive as coming from society being less than, even mm -hmm. if it's like literally like the most thoughtful decision for themselves. Right. We heard from youth that they felt that the best route for getting societal legitimacy was a four-year college degree. Having a degree that like immediately puts respect on your name this is why we have letters after our titles, right? And and things like that and our signatures as professionals. Mm -hmm. Those things matter. And youth know it. It's real in society. And we heard across the board that for women, for individuals from low-income background, and for individuals who identify as coming from Black, Indigenous, people of color, that that was more of a hurdle. I even noticed it in myself. Like when I am introducing myself and why I'm in this work, I will say I have a degree in, right? Because like people wonder, why are you working in design? Well, my degree is in this thing that I'm formally trained in that you might not know about me unless I say it. Mm -hmm. And when I say it, it's going to automatically, like I even perceive like a different reaction. And we heard that just loud and clear, specifically from our youth of color and most clearly from our Black youth who are in college. Mm. They were saying, I chose to go to college. I want to be here, even though this is very difficult and access does not equate belonging. I am not necessarily feeling belonging all the time. Right. I'm actually really in many places not feeling that. But I am here because this is a strategy to fight against systemic racism. Right. The black woman in college, like I knew that I was not going to find a sense of belonging at the PWI I attended. Mm -hmm. Like it's like I'm I'm no, I can't not do this, I think is an exact quote from one of the interviewees. Yeah. And I can say for myself, I knew that doing this will actually give me like a lessened sense of belonging than I've experienced anywhere in my educational journey so far. Yeah. So yeah, I think those things, we we felt and heard that tension. That is interesting too. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. But in some ways, in pursuit of legitimacy and the promise of economic mobility, even though we don't know if it's going to get there, you're willing to perhaps trade off some of that sense of belonging. And that's also why the sort of betrayal of then not getting the economic mobility or not getting the degree and actually being in an even more negative position due to your economic situation. You could understand how some of this could really compound some of the distrust and questioning that folks have about the promise of higher education. Yeah, this is the Keystone quote, I think, for this piece on college, a four-year college as a strategy against systemic racism. This interviewee, a young college person said, I got to the point of feeling like I can't not go to college. I feel like as black kids, there is a pressure to go to a four-year college. It didn't feel right to me as a black kid to not go to college. That just didn't sit right with me. Parents are always saying, especially for those who are lower income and maybe barely made it out of high school, they see college as their only way. Hmm. I feel like it's important too to pause and like give that kind of college bottom line up front, which is that what we didn't hear and like conclude is that, okay, so we need to really start moving away from four-year colleges as an important part of the transition to adulthood. We still see the like very real importance of college. Like Teach for America recruits primarily from four-year colleges. Mm -hmm. And 
what we were hearing is that young people need this coordinated like ecosystem of support along right. that pathway. So like mm -hmm. if they're like finding these internal scripts, that there is somewhere they can go to like have additional support and like, okay, I feel like I made a choice that's like bringing all this stigma into my thinking or bringing all these like self-doubts. And I don't want to be alone in navigating this moment. I feel like it's important to say like, yeah, it's not that college is bad. Right. It is that young people are having to navigate this moment alone and they are only hearing one message. And when they're departing from that message, they're having to do that without support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when we ask them, like, how would you know that you are successfully on the other side of this canyon, this metaphorical canyon, having left departed childhood and successfully reaching adulthood? How would you know you're successfully at adulthood? They said a lot of things. What they said really clearly synthesized into three buckets. One, that you're not going to be surprised by, nobody is, economic mobility. Yep. Everybody is in pursuit of economic mobility. We know that that's a necessity. Second one, self-exploration and belonging. Essentially, am I having an experience along this canyon crossing, however I cross it, am I having an experience where I'm finding myself, continually finding and learning about myself, and finding and learning about my people in the multiple facets of ways for myself and my people? Mm -hmm. Like, I and who do I belong to? What are the communities and the groups and the spaces? Am I finding that? Am I making that? And the third one, societal legitimacy, which was frankly like not at all on any of our researchers. Yeah. Are. But it's essentially like, do I now have the qualification, the credibility, whether it's a degree, the experience, the expertise mm. for people to call on me mm. and say, I need you for this thing, or you have great resources or capital, whether it's social capital or whatever. Right. Like, I want you to bring your capital to this space for this mm -hmm. work happening. Mm -hmm. That third point's really interesting, too, in that one of the critiques that's out there around Gen Z is that, you know, they all want to be social media influencers and they're kind of, you know, taking advantage of the new media, but maybe not really pursuing something of substance. And I think what you're outlining here is more a desire for that stamp of legitimacy, but maybe some authentic questioning of the bill of goods that's been given to them to say, like, if you pursue this for your degree and you come out, you know, completed in time and everything's hunky dory, turns out you may not really know how to be an adult yet. And that's now backed up, you know, Jonathan Haidt's book now about, you know, the anxious generation. There is a lot of concern that we've raised a generation that is you know, feeling this anxiety, they feel particularly fraught. I guess, you know, there's hope in that there are programs out there, you know, and that's really part of your audience here is like folks who are trying to figure out how do we build those supports, build the the scaffolding so that folks can actually feel like they're on more stable ground and they can actually get across. But any insights into, you know, the, the types of programs that might work or, or really what this population needs to successfully get across the canyon? Yeah. So what's interesting is like specifically on the societal legitimacy piece, they were like, college is probably the best, most tried path for getting that mm -hmm. marker. That's a lot of mixed results on what is the best path and what is the best combination of things for economic mobility and for belonging and self-exploration. Really yeah. different law on various lines of, of difference mm -hmm. and diversity and still across like everyone that we were speaking to they were saying like, I am not discounting college. Like to Elizabeth's point, like this still feels important to me, whether it's like, because it's culturally significant, whether it's important to my family, whether yeah. it's just a goal and an achievement that I had for myself, whether it is like, I don't want to ever wonder what if, or I yeah. want to have. Um, also your, your social network too. Like, you know, for <laughs> social mobility, the friends you make in that, you know, 18 to 25 range, you know, you're entering adulthood with them. They're going to be your colleagues and peers for the rest of your life. You know, and college, you know, historically has been, you know, even the selectivity or, you know, rejectivity of college has created problems around the cohort that you might be connecting with. But at least there's this idea that to get across this, it's not just caring adults and our parents and families, but it's also, I'm going to reach out across, not be alone and actually have a cohort that I'm kind of crossing the, the canyon with. Yes. And 
you are like beautifully seeding like a piece of this two by two framework. One thing I want to name before we get to the two by two framework as a kind of connect back to something that you said earlier about this generation really questioning institutions, but that came through loud and clear. They're questioning all sorts of institutions and it's not questioning it because they have a framework of or a, a mindset of like all of this needs to be thrown out. They're just deconstructing it all yeah. to like put all the pieces on the table mm -hmm. to then be able to like reconstruct it and make it their own. Critical and they, thinking. People say critical thinking is a good thing. Oh, See? my God. It's amazing. We need to put some more respect on Gen Z's name. This is them actually like being able to do things that I think that other generations have not been able to do. I think we look at the discourse around Gen Z and like being the anxious generation, these things. It's like actually that they're just letting themselves feel the impact of the world in ways previous generations haven't. So like, yeah. mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. they're going to save us all. Yeah. <laughs> Radically change the world in ways that we all need. I mean, the way that they are interrogating institutions, and it is not just college. Yes, like it is college, and this is the context with this research. But we were hearing like, it is college, it is the institution of marriage, it is the institution of home buying, it is the institution of building wealth. I mean, with the GameStop short, like, mm -hmm hacking that whole system yeah religion like they are deconstructing all of these institutions not because the institutions aren't meaningful but because they're not just going to march in a direction and just like receive the status quo and like okay yeah. okay because my parents and grandparents they are like what are my core values what's meaningful to me what comprises all of this are there things here that like i don't like because i can rebuild it I yeah. can put the Legos back into place in a different way that, that is really meaningful to me. And so we actually see them talking about that. Like, I want to take a year to like explore and work and maybe do an internship before I go to college. But when I start, I actually want to do two years at a community college, get some of my like general eds first. Then I want to like use both of those experiences to then have some of these boot camp or accelerated apprenticeships, then I think from there, I really want to go to a four-year. Like, right. they're thinking about this in a non-linear, very creative, like, DIY hacking, and that's some of the language that they were using, type mm. of way. One of the people that we interviewed, one of the young people we interviewed, said, I really wish that life after high school was like a grocery store marketplace or like a ice cream shop where I could go in and I could try different samples and I wouldn't even have to like pay to try a sample. It's like low entry, low risk, low yep. risk entry or at a marketplace kind of grocery store where I know some of the things I want to get. I have like three things on my list I'm going to get, but I also really want to like see and try out some of the new things that are there and get exposure to things and people and experiences that I wouldn't otherwise get. Yeah. And I don't want to have to be told like, here are all the things that you have to do in this order, even when those things like I don't want to cook with those things. I don't like eggplant. Right. Like, tell me I have to eat eggplant. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it reminds me. I mean, the relevance question comes up all the time. And it, it's almost like an authentic questioning of like, is this relevant for me? And then if you think about this as a population who collectively we've all been forced into this massive social experiment of COVID and post-COVID and not to mention polarization and now AI, like it does feel like the foundations that we used to believe to be true are now being shook in all sorts of ways, which is why in some ways feeling like the ground is not solid beneath you is because maybe it isn't, which then gets me to the point of like, how do we help them? How do we kind of impart some sort of positive trajectory and really support for this group, this population who's really feeling alone and vulnerable at a time where, you know, hopefully they can successfully get to a healthy adulthood. Yeah. I, I think first and foremost, they want authenticity always, all the time from everyone. So any of this, like, if this, then that, like nobody can assure those type of things these days. Right. If then scenarios of like, this will get you success or this will get you right out. The whole fake it till you make it, they don't like. Yeah. 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 The like, the authenticity of like, this might be hard. This might be very different for you than how it was experienced for me. Here's how it was experienced for me. Yeah. Other people who experienced it differently. Mm -hmm. And specifically, we spoke with the organizations first who've been supporting youth as they are navigating life after high school 
for decades, people who did it one way. And then like I used to think I now think and now I'm doing differently. People who are joining into this realm with new organizations and new innovations. We spoke with them first and then we spoke with the youth. But we as we were speaking with the organizations, we were starting to see a new way of how they were orienting to youth and organizations who were doing this very innovatively to bring additional support and really like an ecosystem, a more cohesive ecosystem around youth. And so that, like first and foremost, what we need is a more cohesive ecosystem that's working collaboratively, mm -hmm. thinking about the diverse need and those three markers of success that we heard from youth, economic mobility, self-exploration and belonging, and societal legitimacy. He put a lot of expectation that college was going to deliver all of those. And I didn't even know that college, whatever college is, like necessarily signed up for that. Like society right. to put like, you'll get everything you need to become an adult from college. Like mm -hmm. it's unrealistic for anybody to carry that burden. Right. So how do we actually think about different organizations helping to develop those things for youth in different ways? Mm -hmm. And the organizations, I mean, this generation, they were born in the most ambiguous time of the world. From my understanding, I haven't been in the world the entire time the world has, has existed, but like this is all we are doing is navigating ambiguity. And they were born into that. They are so used to it. They're mm -hmm. like, yeah, this is ambiguous. And so when you pretend like it's not ambiguous, they're like flags. Right. You can't act like you know what's going to happen on the other side or like what the landscape is even going to be like. Right. So it's really about like in the research, as we were speaking with folks, we started to see this like two by two that was emerging. The Y axis essentially being how the adults orient to the youth, what their relationship is like. So at the top of it, are they flexible? Are they like, what do you need? What do you want to talk about? What's on your mind? What are your barriers? What are your hopes and dreams? Like really flexibly knowing them as an individual or at the bottom of that Y axis, is their relationship fixed? Like I see. If you need FAFSA support, if you need help brainstorming ideas for internships, come to my office. I'm here from this time to this time. Here's where you can find me. I see. The x-axis of how these organizations, how we're seeing them like organizing, the x-axis is in relationship to how individual or collective the youth experience that that organization or that offering. So is it an individual experience, whether it's like a digital, virtual, or with a person, or is it a group experience where I have membership and belonging? Mm -hmm. And we're seeing like in that two by two, in that X, Y axis, the three markers of success were starting to like actually flourish more clearly, right? Like if I'm seeking belonging and self-exploration, being in a group is actually going to be really helpful. Having something in my ecosystem, in my own experience, that is a group experience where I can feel a belonging, I can tap in, I can tap out. And I know that that space is always there and will receive me. And being a part of that space, I'm not only learning about them and finding my people, I'm also learning about myself. Because as right. you're talking about yourself, I'm reflecting on how is that similar or different for me? Mm -hmm. about myself. In this two by two, in the different quadrants, we have trail guides who are at the, the high flexible, high individual who are like, I will come alongside you and help right. you. It's kind of like the personal tutor or coach, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, who like, I, I know you really well. Actually, what's interesting is to come back to TFA alumni, Elizabeth and myself and, and a host of others who we spoke with in this experience, you would be hard pressed to find a TFA alumni who's not a trail guide mm. and hasn't been for at least a number of students that wanted that and pursued that from that core member. So there are, there are these quadrants and actually the two by two, like instinctively, like people are just compelled to like map and figure out where they are in this two by two. Yeah. Both in a, like, where am I actually realistically and aspirationally, where do I actually want to be? To, like, use TFA as, as an organization, as an example. TFA is a transport helicopter. Hmm. That's in the quadrant of, like, it's a group membership experience, and it's fixed. Like, we do a specific thing. Hmm. We're not helping you have self-actualization in any realm of what you might want to do as a professional. You will become a teacher. Right. Help you become a really good one. You're yeah. going to get all the support and you're going to have a group and membership and belonging and identity and all of that. And within Teach for America, as a transport helicopter, there's this questioning and, and thought of like aspirationally, like it actually works really well when we have trail guide experiences, even for our core members. Mm -hmm. They themselves are going through the journey. And we've seen core members have better experiences when they have a trail guide kind of mentor or someone who's gone a bit before them. 
It's amazing. And then to get all four types, there are two others. So there's trail guide, transport, helicopter. What are the other two? Map maker. Map maker is at the intersection of individual relationship and fixed. Uh -huh. so map maker is actually super, super interesting because this is a new player in the ecosystem that's recently showing up actually with a lot of growth and acceleration of AI and generative AI. There but we go. We hit the, the magic buzzword before the yeah. end of the conversation. That's great. Yeah. Being able to like use technology to map the landscape and even create some metrics and indicators and evaluators so that youth can go, yeah. okay, here are the things I care about. Here are the things I'm interested in. Here are the values. Like frameworks and profiles and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Mm -hmm. myself and like what organizations are doing this well? Like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm check out Marcy Labs, or I might want to check out Propel because I'm interested in what those kind of things of what they are doing. Yeah. And then speaking of actually those two organizations, the last quadrant that those organizations are actually great exemplars of is Bridge Builders. Mm -hmm. So Bridge Builders is at the intersection of a group experience with a flexible adult, an adult who is what we as a researcher sometimes called your 3 a.m. speed dial. Like mm -hmm. who, who in your life is showing up as a person who if you really needed to, you might yeah. actually like call them at an unacceptable hour, right? Yeah. And really the indicator of that relationship is like, do they have your email or do they have your phone number? Mm. Like, what does the youth orient to you as an adult? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, it is still a collective experience that carries mm. an element of like identifying with and belonging with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's amazing stuff. There's a lot to chew on here. Clearly we'll include links to all this in the show notes for the episode. And, uh, you know, I think if, if anything, it sounds like there's a framework there for folks who are trying to get into the solution space around there are different ways in which you might be able to engage. And even you as a helper, as a nonprofit, as someone who's trying to make an impact, that there are other folks who are thinking about this. And that's part of the the mission, really, of the, the reinvention lab, I, I would imagine. So we're pretty much at time. It's been an amazing conversation here with Colleen Keating Crawford and Elizabeth Booz from Teach for America reinvention lab. As we're wrapping up here, I always like to give folks opportunities for closing thoughts, takeaways for our listeners, maybe starting with you, Elizabeth, and then concluding with you, Colleen. Final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there is this opportunity for folks to apply this in like hyper local context and really like map the ecosystem in which you are operating and see like do we have a lot of trail guides here and no one really doing bridge builder work do we have a lot of like bridge builders and no one really just like getting folks from point a to point b as transport helicopters so mm. I think the invitation of what to do with all of this like kind of conceptual thinking is like map your local ecosystem and see where do young people potentially need more support than they're getting right now. And yeah, follow us at Reinvention Lab at Teach for America. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that. Thank you, Elizabeth. We've seen that the organization, whatever quadrant folks are in, the organizations who are thinking about this in a hyper-local way, either like the local youth I want to be supporting geographically or youth that are, that are focused in pursuing this type of thing, so whether they're thinking industry local or geographically local, they're showing up as the ones who are like making the most acceleration or impact for young people. Mm -hmm. So I think about it in that way, like Elizabeth was saying, mapping your, your geographically local, or again, this could be like industry specific. Like if you are focused on computer science and helping youth like cross the canyon in that way, map out that industry specific ecosystem. And then thinking about what does and doesn't exist and who, which organizations or people are doing different pieces of the quadrant really well based on where you are what can you be learning from them or what might you want to like grow in if you are a transport helicopter and you are dynamic at that and so good at that what can you be learning from the bridge builders what can you be learning from the trail guides even if you don't want to shift as a transport helicopter you want to be the best version of that how can you really become the best version of that by learning from the other quadrants yeah I love it. It does remind me of something that's been coming up a lot more, even when talking about AI, is sort of a systems thinking, design thinking, where you can kind of take a step back, understand yourself as both a participant, but then also someone who might have some influence on how the broader system works. Another awakening that's out there, maybe one that could be helped by some of the new advances in technology. Been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much to Elizabeth and Colleen for joining me today on Trending in Ed. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much, Mike. And for our listeners, we'll include links to all the great stuff we talked about. Hopefully you enjoy what you're hearing. Please subscribe, 
write us reviews, tell your friends, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. <laughs>